Ben Sheehan, the author of OMG WTF Does the Constitution Actually Say? Um, it's a great book. I've had a lot of fun reading it the past few days. Um, it was not what I expected, Ben, so I'm going to turn it over to you quickly. Start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what compelled you to do this very irreverent take, um, but highly informative one on the Constitution. Sure. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for having me and hello to everyone in Nashville from uh, not sunny Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, in and around the government, and I remember when I was about six years old, and my mom, who worked in the United States Senate at the time, uh, took a napkin one night over dinner and wrote down, uh, drew two houses, and in one of them she drew the number 100, and in the other she drew the number 435, and I remember that's the first time I, I started learning about, about civics and government. And I studied this uh, in college, uh, and, and afterward I moved to Los Angeles and I worked at a company called Funny or Die, which was founded by Will Farrell and Adam McKay. And a lot of the videos that I produced and, and wrote and put together had to do with politics and government and explaining specifically how it works and, and making issues more accessible to people. And a few years later, I started an organization called OMGWTF, which stands for Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida. Uh, it stands for something else. And I, in the 2018 midterms, focused on educating people about the races for governor, secretary of state, and attorney general. And the reason was more than 70% of those races were up in 2018, but largely people were focused on the Senate and, and the House. and, and there wasn't this focus on, on what I believe to be extremely important races. So what happened was I would have these events and I would show up and before the speaking portion, friends or attendees would come up to me and start asking me questions about Jeff Sessions or Rex Tillerson. And I soon realized that they didn't know their state had a secretary of state. They didn't know that their state had an attorney general, let alone what those jobs did. So this kept happening to the point where I started investigating the state of civics and government education in this country. And what I found is that in the last two decades specifically, we've been drastically cutting civics and government education in our schools. In fact, it's gotten so bad that today only eight states require a year of civics or government at some point between kindergarten and 12th grade. Compare that to the 50s and 60s where classes like civics, government, US history, foundations of democracy were, were everywhere in our public schools. And the reason for that is because in the last 20 years we have had state uh, initiatives and federal laws that have been specifically funding English language arts and, and math and increasing the amount of testing because better scores on the test means more uh, funding and resources. And so we're starving other subjects and civics has been getting crushed and that's why only 16% of, of states require a year of it today. So a lot of those people who have graduated school in the last 18 years are now eligible voters able to participate in democracy but have very little understanding of how the government works um, at the federal state or local level and they weren't lucky like me to have a parent you know educating them over the dinner table with napkins and pencils you know since the age of five. So I thought I would start at the the very beginning of our of our government uh, with our founding document, the Constitution. And I actually had kept my eighth grade copy of the Constitution and I revisited it about a year and a half ago. Uh, I found it very inaccessible. The spoiler alert, the punctuation is very odd. The grammar is weird. Uh, the spelling is odd. And, and it's very, very hard to sort of parse out the underlying information if you're not used to that language or you haven't studied uh, uh, law. And so I, what I wanted to do is sort of lift the floor on the understanding of the Constitution across the country and create this, this very accessible handy guide that I think of as if I had four hours with, with a friend in, in, in an open bar tab, how would I explain the Constitution to them from beginning to end? So that's sort of my approach and the way it's structured is the, the original text is on one side of the spread. Uh, my, my paraphrase translation is on the other side and then I have sort of breakout um, asides. And so by BTW, by the way, is historical context that's necessary to know. There we go. Thank you, Leslie, for, uh, for, uh, for assisting me on this. Um, FYI is explaining terms like bill of attainder. What is that? Uh, ex post facto law. 
Um, NA means, you know, it was in the Constitution, but either through amendments or expiration dates, it's no longer applicable. And then IMO is my own personal thoughts and opinion if, if I think they're particularly needed or relevant. But I'm very careful to, to, to say what, what, what is and isn't my opinion versus what is clearly on the page. So that's sort of the approach. And what I've been really thrilled about is that constitutional law, and I, I, had, I ran this by multiple constitutional law professors, even members of Congress for accuracy. Um, but I've been really excited because many civics and government teachers in high school are leaving rave reviews and, and Amazon and reaching out to me and saying during this weird time of everyone learning at home virtually, they're teaching the book uh, in schools. Um, and it's really for sort of a high school age and above, uh, but there's a kid's version uh, without any cursing uh, coming out next year uh, for ages 8 to 12, uh, which I'm really excited about as well. So that's kind of the background of why I wrote this book, uh, why I feel it's necessary now. And, and the strangest thing is that in the last few months, we keep seeing these constitutional issues materializing in a variety of ways. And I think it's causing a lot of us, I would say maybe some members of government included to go back and look at the document and see what actually is and isn't in there. So that's a little bit about of how I got to write this book, why I thought it was necessary. And uh, it's currently available. Uh, it's also available in, in Spanish. Uh, if there are people who speak Spanish in your life. Uh, there's a Spanish version. Um, and then there's a breakout uh, about gerrymandering specifically. That's a journal. So if you want to write down your grocery lists while learning about uh, the weird gerrymandered shapes in our Congress, uh, there's an option for you too. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to just launch with a couple of kind of local questions that have come uh, either in, a, in our city or in our state recently. The first is, you may not have heard, but Tennessee has just passed a law making it a felony um, under certain circumstances to protest outside of our state capitol. We've had a lot of protests um, since the George Floyd murder. And so our state legislature, which um, is I don't know how much you know about Tennessee, but it's a fairly red state. Um, Nashville and Memphis are, uh, are an exception to that pattern, but that's overall a pretty red state and our legislature reflects that. Um, so the current state legislature passed a law saying that um, basically you can get arrested and it, it counts as a felony um, for protesting outside of government buildings. Tell us about the, con the ACLU sued them instantly, I think within seconds of the governor signing the, the law. Um, tell us about the constitutionality of that. Sure. So <laughs> from what you just described, it certainly does not sound very constitutional at all. Um, in the First Amendment, one of our, our rights, we have uh, uh, Congress cannot make any law that either establishes a, a religion, bans a religion, uh, prevents us from the right of free speech, from free press, uh, peaceably assembling, uh, and petitioning the government for a redress of grievances, which in modern day languages I call complaining about the government to the government. So peaceable assembly is one of our constitutional rights and Congress cannot make any law um, to, to infringe upon that. So I would say that, uh, you know, a, a state legislature uh, doing that is, is a violation. And through the 14th Amendment, basically what it does is it takes the Bill of Rights and it applies it to the, to the states as well. It's something called incorporation. Uh, so yes, it would also be a, a unconstitutional for a state legislature to deny one of your First Amendment uh, uh, rights or any of your, your rights according to the Bill of Rights. All right. Um, we'll see how it ends up playing out, but best of luck. One of the things uh, that the law is is doing also is in addition to making it a felony, it's also stripping people of voting rights who get arrested under that law, um, which opens up a whole nother can of worms. Um, a second one that happened recently is Vanderbilt University is in Nashville and um, they've been making the circuits in um, certain media channels this week over a question that got asked in an elections class on an, uh, a quiz, I think it wasn't an exam, saying that uh, basically racism was built into the Constitution. And it was a true false question and the professor had indicated that the answer was true. Do you feel like with all of the study that you have done that, uh, and you can decline to answer this if you want because it's a kind of, uh, hot topic, I know. But do you feel like um, 
the professors should have asked the question that way. I'll ask you rather than do you think the Constitution has racism built into it, though you can answer that if you want. Well, I, I can't speak to an individual professor's logic behind it, uh, asking a question in a certain way, but I can speak to whether or not I think the Constitution uh, includes racism. And one thing I think we get wrong a lot about the Constitution is what it actually says and what it punts to the states. Um, I will start with slavery because it is very clear uh, that the Constitution, they, they, during the convention, they went to great lengths to not mention slavery by name. In fact, the first time that slavery ever comes up by name is the, is the 13th Amendment to abolish it in 1865. But it does deal with slavery directly, though not by name, three times throughout the document. And the first one is I'm, what I'm sure many people here are familiar with is the three-fifths compromise. And it said that when you're counting the population for the purpose of determining two things, one is how many people are paying taxes, because back in 1789, when it went into effect, people paid taxes per person. Uh, so everyone paid an equal amount. So getting the state population means knowing how much tax you're going to collect from the state. And the other is deciding how many people are represented in the House of Representatives, therefore, it's because it's related to population. So the system they came up with, which had actually been pitched for the Articles of Confederation a few years before that, it wasn't used, was free people counted as one. People who were in service or labor for a fixed amount of time. So, you know, if you were paying a, off a debt through labor for three years or whatever, you counted as one. Uh, Native Americans who were not taxed counted as zero, and all other persons counted as three-fifths of a person. And what they meant by that are, is enslaved people. So right there in the first article, we have uh, early on, we have a, a, a mention of slavery where, where slaves are counted as 60% of a person. Now, this, this ended officially with the 14th uh, Amendment establishing uh, a birthright citizenship and ending the three-fifths compromise. But we also see it in that part, the Constitution preserved the international slave trade until 1808. Um, Thomas Jefferson, even though he was a, a slave, he's actually owned the most sla uh, slaves of any president ever, um, over 600, but he removed the United States from the international slave trade on the very first day possible, which was January 1st, 1808. And then another time that slavery comes up, and they refer to it as importation. Again, not specifically slavery, but they knew what they were referring to. We all know what they were referring to. And the third thing is the Fugitive Slave Clause, which says that if a slave, uh, enslaved person escaped from a, a state, even if they escaped to a state that didn't allow slavery, they had to be returned uh, to their, their owners in the, um, in the state from which they fled. So slavery is built into the Constitution, and, and it is also built into the Electoral College because that's how we select uh, uh, you know, our, our, our electoral votes are directly related to our senators and our representatives. And in 1789, how did we choose representatives? It was based on the three-fifths compromise. So that was originally built in to the Electoral College. So it's undeniable that slavery was built into the document, even though it wasn't mentioned by name until 1865. Uh, but the last thing I want to say about this is that we often think I think of a misunderstanding about what the Constitution does and doesn't say about voting. And what's really interesting is that it doesn't actually say who can and can't vote. It leaves this up to the states. So in, you know, in, again, in the first, uh, in the first article, uh, it says that if you are able to vote for your state house members, so the members of the, of the Tennessee state house, you can vote for US representatives from Tennessee. And when the 17th Amendment was ratified in 1913, it said the same thing, because before that, state legislatures just picked the senators. We actually haven't voted for senators uh, uh, we've only since 1913 have we been able to vote directly for, for senators. Um, and so as of 1913, if you can vote for your state house, you can vote for your US senator. Um, but it largely left this decision to the states. And so you saw state laws that said only white men who owned property uh, could vote, which in, on average was about 6% of every state. 
but that's actually not in the constitution. And they punted that because they wouldn't be able to get all the Southern states to go along with it. If they said people, everyone could vote, enslaved people could vote, the states would have never agreed to the constitution. So they punted a lot of the things that we think are built in there to the states. And then at the state level, um, you know, racism was, was codified versus, you know, in, in who can and can't vote and, and in so many other ways. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Great. So just a quick follow up on the voting and then um, people are posting questions in the chat. So I'm gonna move over and take some of those. Um, and everyone, please do that. Um, put your questions in the chat and I'll go through and grab them. But there's been a lot of talk about rights to vote around COVID-19. Um, again, not sure how much you know about Tennessee, but our state is one that does not have a very expansive mail-in voting program. You, have, you can only vote by mail under certain um, conditions and being afraid of getting COVID at the poll has been ruled not to be one of those um, conditions. So according to what you've just told us, that's legal. The state's allowed to make its own voting laws. States are allowed to make their own laws around voting, yes. However, Congress can over, can, according to the constitution, make or alter those regulations. So Congress could pass a law saying that every state must let its residents vote by mail regardless of an excuse because of COVID-19. In fact, there have been several bills that have been introduced in Congress saying this, none of them have passed, both houses of, of Congress. So yes, it is legal, it is constitutional for Tennessee to say you need an excuse to, in order to, uh, you know, vote by mail regardless of COVID-19. It's also constitutional for Congress to say, no, we think actually everyone has the right to vote uh, given the pandemic. And so we're going to mandate by federal law uh, that every state has to allow people to vote by mail, you know, without an excuse. That's probably not going to happen before November 3rd. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> um, what about nationally? So are there things in the Constitution that have to do with the U.S. Postal Service and the changes that have been made there around uh, the past few weeks? Sure. So the, the, the post office is, is in the Constitution. It's in, it's again in Article 1. It's a power of Congress to establish post offices and post roads. That's all it says. So basically what it means is that, you know, the post office ultimately falls under the jurisdiction of Congress. So Congress can, you know, set up new post offices, expand it, certainly fund uh, uh, postal uh, uh, post offices. Um, so yeah, that Congress has the ultimate oversight of, of the post office according to the constitution. All right. Um, so our first uh, question, it wasn't really a question. Thank you, Rick, for posting some clarification uh, on the law that I was telling you about. So. Um, being on state, camping on state property was previously a misdemeanor. It's now going to be a felony. They'll go one to six years in prison, lose the right to vote and the right to carry a gun. Um, it also criminalized, I guess, I'm guessing you can see this, marking with chalk on a government building um, and introduced mandatory minimum sentences. So, um, yeah. Well, one, um, <laughs> one thing I want to add quickly about uh, losing the right to vote felony disenfranchisement is that this is something that is also has its roots in in the constitution in the 14th amendment we often think of the 14th amendment we think of the first section of it and we think about birthright citizenship and we think about equal protection of the laws but it's five sections long and the second section has to do with voting rights and and the the seed of felony disenfranchisement is actually in there and what it says is that if you are 21 years old a man the first time it, that, that, that gender is codified in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, uh, a male, uh, 21 years older, you're a resident of your state, a US citizen, if your state prevents you from voting, the state gets penalized. It gets less of a, a population basis for representatives in the House. But it wouldn't get penalized, it says, or other crime. So if you had committed a crime, it wouldn't get penalized. And so what happened is in the subsequent decades, um, you know, states looked at that and started to use felony disenfranchisement as a way to deny people the right to vote. And today, it's again, at the state level, you have an extreme case where Iowa, Virginia, and Kentucky bar felons from voting for life, even if they've served their time and, and are no longer on probation or parole. Um, on the opposite end of that, you have Maine and Vermont, which let people vote while they're incarcerated. So it's a huge range of, you know, taking away your lifetime voting rights uh, and letting you vote forever, regardless of whether you're uh, incarcerated or on probation or parole. Um, and again, it's leaving it all up to the states. 
All right. Um, so a little more speculative. Somebody asked about the political and cultural time in which the Constitution was written. How do you think our framers would write the Constitution if they were rewriting it today? Or I guess writing it for the first time today. Yeah, Les, Les could, I, could I embellish Go ahead. it? Um, ben, my question is, is that the Constitution was basically written by a bunch of elite white men. And if those elite white men lived today, they would probably be on the right side of the aisle, most many of them. I'm just curious what you think those founders would, how they might frame law today, given the mindset that they came to the Constitution with. Sure. So it's absolutely correct that it was all uh, uh, elite white men who wrote the Constitution. Um, it was 55 people and then 39 ended up signing it. Um, but what I find really interesting is a lot of the things that we kind of think were foregone conclusions and, and you know, layups were actually huge debates. Slavery was a huge debate. About half of the people who were at the Constitutional Convention, I think it's about 25 out of 55, were, were slave owners. There are also many people, delegates from states like you know, Massachusetts, that hated slavery, were appalled by it, and called people out on the floor. And it, and it was a real substan substantive debate. Um, and there are also things that we think that you know, are, are foregone conclusions, like uh, you know, the Electoral College. The Electoral College is one of the last things that was discussed at the, at the convention. And the conversation, it, it wasn't that people were opposed to a popular vote. Uh, it was that they were deciding between, should Congress pick the president? Should uh, uh, you know, state legislatures pick? Uh, I mean, which, should we elect people who just have this one purpose uh, to elect a president, which is what they went with? But, I think there are a lot of things that, and I agree with you, you know, I guess given the, the, the demographic makeup of the parties today, um, you know, one looks a lot more like the people who wrote the Constitution. Um, I do think there are some things that would hold up, but I also think there are things there, and, and you get this by reading Madison's notes at the convention, that we kind of, I was surprised to learn that there were some pretty progressive discussions happening there. Um, I will tell you that I think the founders would be appalled by what our Congress is doing. Uh, they'd be appalled by the partisanship. They'd be appalled by the inaction, the way that it is used to, uh, I mean, it's, the Senate was always designed to be a backstop on, on the House to a degree, but to constantly block everything that comes out of it and do nothing and play politics with it, um, I think they'd be horrified by that. And, and this is exactly what they wanted to uh, avoid. Uh, that's why they gave most of the power to Congress so that it wasn't a single individual who had that power. But what we're seeing is basically, you know, presidents just trying to legislate by executive order because so little was happening in Congress. So I think they would be genuinely appalled by the state of how our country looks. And I also think the last thing I'll, I'll include in this answer is they wanted the constitution to be changed. Um, there was a conversation between James Madison and Thomas Jefferson where Jefferson, even though he wasn't a part of the Constitutional Convention and didn't sign it because uh, he wasn't in the country, um, they talked about how often the Constitution should be changed or, or amended. And Jefferson thought that it should be changed every 19 years, not amended, a new Constitution every 19 years, because he thought it was like having a coat that fit you as a child and expecting that 20 years later to fit you as an adult, because laws change, people change, the times change, and the Constitution should change with it. Not everybody shared that, uh, uh, that, that stance, that, that viewpoint on the Constitution, but I do think that we often are made to believe like the founders wrote this and didn't want it to change and it's gotta be exactly like it was back then. And the entirety of Article 5 is the amendment process. They wanted us to change this to fit our times. Great. Um, somebody else posted about the question I had asked, uh, asked you about the Vanderbilt class, his son's in the class. Um, I agree with you, Lee, that it was taken out of context. Um, it was just one item uh, posted onto social media sites. Um, and it definitely was a true false question, but I think that's part of what made the student who complained about it to some media outlets um, so upset is that, you know, it's a simple true false and the right answer was supposed to be true. And it was saying that the constitution was racist. And so they, they went on kind of a, uh, an interpretation based on that. Um, let me just scroll through. 
Um, what is Constitution Day? So it's coming up on September 17th. Um, it, it's not a day when we write a new constitution. Um, <laughs> so what, 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 where did this day come from? What are we supposed to do then? Sure. Um, well, we don't have to do anything. Uh, maybe do some self-reflection on, on the state of the country, but the Consti uh, Constitution Day is the day the Constitution was signed. So the, the Constitutional Convention ran from May 25th, 1787 to September 17th. Uh, on Constitution Day, uh, 39 people signed the Constitution. It's actually 38. One guy signed for his friend who was sick uh, in Delaware. But um, the Constitution was signed on that day. And so in a little less than four months, uh, this document was written that still governs us today, and it's actually the oldest constitution still in use of any country in the world. Um, so for almost four very hot months in Philadelphia, crammed into Independence Hall with no, no AC, uh, and they, you know, they weren't in like t-shirts and shorts. So it's very sweaty summer in Philadelphia. Uh, these uh, 55 uh, white men wrote this uh, document and they signed it on the 17th of September. And so we, we, we think about that and I, I guess look back on it, um, you know, on the 17th. Great. Um, I want to go back to the First Amendment for just a few minutes. Um, one of the things that um, the Jewish community is interested in, as our other religious communities, is kind of clarification around the freedom of religion that's expressed there. And you sometimes hear people talking about the difference between freedom of religion and freedom from religion and this idea that certain religions are under attack or something like that. Can you talk a little bit about, so I mean, it's a pretty parse, I'm just reading it out of your book, right? So all this says is Congress can't make a law establishing a religion, right? And so where did we go kind of so far from that in terms of the way people interpret that particular um, well, you know, it's interesting because freedom of, of religion and, and, you know, the fact that Congress cannot establish or ban a religion, uh, religion comes up a number of times in the Constitution. It's actually not just in the First Amendment. And, and what I find interesting is that the, the people who wrote this document went out of their way to make sure people had religious freedom. And you see this when people take the oath of office, right? When you're, when you're a, a, a federal government employee, when you're elected to federal office, you take an oath of office and you're given the opportunity to either swear an oath or an affirmation. So they gave people the ability to not have a religious, uh, through affirmation, a, a non-religious way to promise that you were gonna uphold the constitution. Um, it also says that you cannot be made to take a religious test to hold federal office. Uh, that's in the original articles of the Constitution. And then again, uh, First Amendment, Congress can't ban or establish a, a religion. So there are examples throughout the entire document where they go out of their way to make sure people know and that people who serve in government know that you aren't swearing your fealty to a specific religion uh, and we're also not preventing you from exercising it. Obviously, religious freedom uh, was very core to this document and we see this pop up um, in, in a number of ways. As far as where we have gone away from this, I think it's a big question because you, you see, I mean, there's, you know, you see religious freedom laws like, you know, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and that goes, you know, there was an example of that in many states. Um, but um, I really think that at its core, you know, this is, this is something that was, that was, you know, pretty unanimous among, among the founders that we have the freedom to believe what we want to believe and, you know, look at the conditions of the people who came over here, they were being religiously persecuted. So it's very much foundational to this country. Another thing is that the God is nowhere in the constitution. Um, it's not mentioned anywhere. So anyone who tells you that is not, is not telling the truth or they're getting it confused with the Declaration of Independence. But um, they really went out of their way to make this document, um, you know, uh, recognize multiple faiths or people making sure that people are not being made to swear to a certain faith uh, to live in this country, uh, participate democratically in this country, uh, or to hold federal office. Um, Avi had a follow up talking about um, that most of the writers of our constitution had just been through a process of protest and rebellion themselves, so they were very well steeped in that. 
um, and they were privileged. So do you think, how do you think they would have responded to the protests that are happening now? So you've told us that they wanted the constitution to be changed. Um, so would they have welcomed and embraced people thinking differently than them from the bottom up? So the ironic thing is that what led to the constitutional convention is very much what we're talking about right now. So in 1786, sort of toward the end, uh, I think it was August, um, a number of uh, working class people in Massachusetts surrounded and took over a courthouse. And they were angry because the state of Massachusetts was taxing them very heavily. In fact, it was taxing them worse than they were being taxed while they were under British rule. And so they revolted and they took over a courthouse. And then a few months later, a guy named Daniel Shays, uh, some of you may have heard of Shays' Rebellion from history class, uh, led, led a rebellion uh, on, a, on a weapons arsenal and, and some people were, were, were shot at and killed. And what happened in, in ensuing elections is that those working class people, they were not elites. They, a lot of them were white men, but they were not elites. They were you know, the bottom of the economic uh, uh, totem pole, I guess. And they ended up winning a lot of state legislative seats in Massachusetts. So this revolt from taking over a courthouse to you know, marching on a weapons arsenal to winning state legislative seats terrified a lot of the white male elites in Massachusetts. And other states looked at this and went, oh crap, this could happen here. So they wanted to find a way where they could have a more strong, a strong central government to prevent uprisings like the one that just happened in Massachusetts. And that is part of what led to the Constitutional Convention happening and having a new constitution because the Articles of Confederation was a very loose agreement of states and there wasn't an obligation for, for you know, a, a central government or, or states to come in and help each other out, um, uh, you know, defense wise and sharing resources and, and, and funding each other uh, domestically, it was more designed to, you know, protect from abroad. So a lot of this was the impetus for writing the constitution. So the sad thing is I probably think on some level, some of them might not be happy with a class uprising since they didn't like it. And that's what led to them writing the document. But I also think that uh, people like James Madison, who wrote the Bill of Rights, he wrote the entire Bill of Rights, he wrote the First Amendment, uh, I think he would support this. People using their freedom of speech, their First Amendment right to protest what they think is unjust and keep the government in check. And so I think uh, uh, some people might oppose it and some people might support it. They were a diverse group. Um, I think people forget that sometimes and glom them all together. Um, Another question following up on the freedom of religion. So based on what you said about religion and its role in the Constitution, are there things that take place at the federal level that you would suggest be changed to better align with lack of religion in the Constitution? Are there things that I would better check? I would say you certainly see, I mean, something we've all seen, you know, the, the policy that happened right after um, the current president took office, um, banning certain people from coming here from, you know, majority Muslim countries. Um, you know, whether you're saying it for defense, I think the, I think the, the connotations, the sort of uh, subtext of that is really alarming, uh, that it does seem like there was a, a, a religious motivation or tied to a religious motivation. Um, I do think that it comes up, it, 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 another area of controversy is when, you know, education is not mentioned in the Constitution, uh, but, you know, for Congress has the ability to raise money uh, through our taxes to, you know, finance the common defense and, and the general welfare. And part of that is, is the welfare of all people is, is getting educated. So, you know, Congress can fund education in, in states. And, you know, it's, it's a constant question whether or not they should be able to fund, you know, religious institutions, whether it should be public schools, you know, that are unconnected to a religion. Um, the separation of church and state is really more of a, a, a recent argument. In fact, that, that phrase, even though it's an old Thomas Jefferson phrase, it was really, it really became, you know, codified in a Supreme Court decision in the, in the 40s. But I think that you, by looking at the Constitution, it is extremely clear that religious freedom is, 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 appears many times. Uh, it's core to the document. And I don't think that, you know, the, I, I don't believe from what I've read and studied that the founders would support taking federal money and, and you know, focusing it on religious institutions. Um, uh, you know, religious institutions obviously get tax uh, exempt status, but 
giving preference to uh, schools that are, are religious schools, you know, this is not something that I think personally they would have, um, they would have supported. Um, so you're getting some praise. One of our members is a former middle school principal and he hopes that you're training teachers because um, he says um, you talk and teach history in such a thoughtful way. So oh, um, <laughs> um, talk to us a little bit about what the Constitution says about the role of the Attorney General. Um, so in particular, can you if you are the president, say hypothetically, could you use the Attorney General as your personal lawyer? Uh, well, the Attorney General isn't in the Constitution. Uh, it's part of the uh, executive branch and the Attorney General and the Department of Justice came, uh, you know, significantly after. The first cabinet position was Secretary of State, uh, which is why uh, we have the, um, the, the line of succession. Congress can establish the line of succession of the presidency. So it's, the, you know, if something happens, the president, the vice president takes over. If something happens, the vice president, it's Speaker of the House, president pro tempore, and then Secretary of State, because that's the first cabinet position. So it's every cabinet head in order of creation. So the very last one would be Homeland Security. Um, but as far as the Justice Department, you know, I think what is being alluded to with this question is, is an abuse of power. And there is a provision in the Constitution that allows for the Congress to uh, remove a president uh, if they abuse their power, and that process is impeachment. And I think the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors, so treason, bribery, and high crimes and misdemeanors are the, are the things that uh, are supposed to be used in order to impeach somebody um, if they've committed one of those things. And we misunderstand the high crimes and misdemeanors because they're actually talking about high crimes and high misdemeanors. High misdemeanors is in the Articles of Confederation. It was something that was commonly understood to mean things like abuse of power, abuse of your office, corruption, things that are not necessarily, you know, crimes according to federal code, but things that any reasonable person could say, you know, and, and this comes from, you know, England and, and, and other legal systems, um, are, are reasons not to trust a president. In fact, originally they had discussed putting the word maladministration in there as a reason to uh, impeach president, and James Madison thought it was too broad. But high, high misdemeanors were something that were understood as a reason to impeach a president. So whether the president is using uh, um, his, uh, his office to uh, give favors to friends, uh, uh, to enrich his businesses in some covert way that isn't you know, specifically criminal, uh, to abuse power using the, uh, um, you know, using the White House uh, to you know, advocate for their reelection, using federal funds uh, to, to, uh, for campaign expenses. Um, you know, some of these, these things would certainly fall under maladministration, high misdemeanors, and the provision is that Congress can remove a president for doing that. But if the Congress doesn't do that, the only other way to remove a president is through the 25th Amendment, and that was originally designed in the wake of the, the Kennedy assassination in case a president was incapacitated. So it wasn't for like a corrupt president, it was if the president is, is, is injured, shot, harmed, and, and not dead, but not able to cognitively function, here's a way to remove that, that person and establish uh, the vice president. But as far as the attorney general, again, the attorney general can be impeached. Uh, federal officers can be impeached, it, not members of Congress. They have their own way to remove an, uh, a senator representative. You can get kicked out if two thirds of your, your, your chamber uh, thinks that you should go. But the attorney general can be impeached. And so could we impeach uh, Bill Barr? Yes, we could do the same impeachment process for the, the president as for, as for him and, and members of, of the cabinet. Um, you know, like this has happened. This has been, has been discussed. It's been mostly judges, but, um, but people in the cabinet can be impeached. So there are, there is a way to deal with somebody who's a corrupt as a president, as a attorney general. Um, but that is the key provision. If Congress isn't going to act on that, then you know, it comes down to, to legal opinions on whether a sitting official can be tried uh, for crimes uh, while in office, a sitting president, some Justice Department, uh, um, uh, some Justice Department officials have said yes, some have said no. Uh, uh, it goes back to memos from the Nixon administration from uh, during the Clinton impeachment. Ken Starr thought that actually president could be, uh, a sitting president could be tried. So that comes down to the courts and, and legal interpretation. But the main way that we get rid of a corrupt official at the federal level is through impeachment. And if we're not going to impeach them, then, you know, we're, we're not adhering to the Constitution. All right. Um, so kind of as a follow up to that, somebody asked 
explicitly, to what extent do you think this president is breaking the law regarding his excessive or executive privilege um, decrees? So executive orders have been around for a long time. And they've been, you know, Teddy Roosevelt issued a ton of executive orders. The most ever was during FDR's presidency. Obviously, he was president for the longest, so that makes sense. Um, but executive orders are specifically meant, they're not in the Constitution. Uh, they're specifically meant to enforce existing laws. So they're orders from the president to help enforce a law that's been passed by Congress. They are not laws unto themselves. So what I think has happened in recent decades, as I mentioned earlier, is that you have Congress that is largely gridlocked, stagnant, whether it's partisanship, whether it's lobbying, whether it's, you know, political posturing, whatever it is, um, you have a Congress that is not doing its job. And so a president is trying, you know, sometimes presidents are trying to go around that inaction uh, and legislate from the executive branch. And that is not at all what the founders intended. That is not how they designed our government it was created in response to a monarchy. So the last thing they wanted was one individual making all the laws and uh, you know, passing the, the um, power down through bloodlines. So they gave the power to voters, to people, uh, to elect representatives. And those representatives had oversight of the president. Congress can impeach and remove the president. The president can't impeach and remove Congress. So I think, you know, this is executive orders are, are, are something that are legal if they're enforcing existing laws. If they are acting as laws unto themselves, they are blatantly unconstitutional. All right. Um, can we talk a little bit about the upcoming election? Because I think there's confusion among a lot of people about what the Constitution says about the various outcomes. So I'm going to give you two. There are a lot of scenarios that we can okay. talk about. So one is if the election is not certified, so the results of the election are not certified, um, what happens? Um, and the second is what happens if there's a tie in the electoral college? Okay, so not certified and tie. So certification of election results happens at the state level. It's, you know, the governor, the secretary of state, uh, they certify. And I'm talking about election results specifically for president. I assume that that's what this is in, not rather than congressional elections or, or okay, so president. Um, so this is mostly by statute, what I'm about to outline. But what's important to know here is that it is state legislatures that have the power to decide how electors are appointed. So the, the Congress can establish what day the electors give their votes, uh, but it's up to the state legislature to decide the manner of appointing electors. And a lot of us take this for granted because ever since 1880, in every state, it's been a popular vote, as it is in Tennessee, as it is in Delaware, as it is in California, wherever. All of the, you know, people, people vote, a statewide popular vote, and in 48 states, it's just done as a majority uh, uh, vote, and all of the electors are assigned to, uh, the slate of electors is assigned to that person, but we're not voting for president directly, we're voting for which slate of electors will then vote for the president. But before 1880, a lot of states would choose the electors themselves, and people wouldn't have a voice in the process, and it gets to the, the core of the issue, which is that we do not have the constitutional right to vote for president. Um, so that, that, that is just a truth. That is a, that is a fact of the, of the constitution, that it's state legislatures that decide the, how to appoint the electors. And what I'm worried about is what happens after November 3rd, because what we haven't seen happen but could happen is that state legislatures, now here, here's where federal law comes into play. So this is not the constitution, this is federal law. But it says that if by December 8th, this year, December 8th, uh, if there are controversies around the vote for electors, the appointment of electors, states can come up with a new way to appoint the electors. And as long as they come up with that way and, and execute it by December 8th, uh, it's binding. Um, if they don't have and pick a new way, uh, then they have basically until December 14th, which is this date this year where the electors actually vote. Um, so what you could see uh, and I'm, I, this is what I'm most fearful of, is that somehow uh, elections uh, are, are, whether it's at the federal level, whether it's as governors in the state, are, there's claims of fraud, uh, voter fraud, people voting illegally, uh, and this reaches a fever pitch to the point where the state legislature in that state 
declares, refuses to certify the results and says before December 8th, we can't trust the presidential election, 3 million people voted illegally, the duly elected members of the state legislature are gonna pick the electors themselves. And what you could have happen is if this happened in Tennessee, the legislature could constitutionally find a new way of appointing the electors and they could pick a Republican slate of, of electors or a Democratic slate of electors. However, the process that happens after that is interesting because there, there was foresight to, to deal with what happens if competing slates of electors are sent. And we have precedent for this. So in 1876, uh, during the, uh, uh, the election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden, what happened is that competing slates of electors were sent by uh, you know, around four states. Uh, I, I believe it was Florida, uh, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Oregon. Uh, some of those states sent multiple slates. So like the governor sent one slate to, uh, to DC. The legislature sent one slate to DC. And the law that was passed in the wake of this dealt for this issue. So when the electoral votes are actually counted, so on January, so you can mark your calendars, January 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern, Central Time for Tennessee, Mike Pence will provide, pr preside over a counting of the electoral votes in front of Congress. And as they go state by state, uh, they read off the results and one senator and one representative can object and then the chambers retire to the uh, to discuss the objections and, and decide what's going to happen. But if multiple slates are sent and the argument is over which slate to count, the governor certified slate is counted according to federal law. So this kind of leads into the second part, the second question, which is what happens if there's a tie. So on January 6th, they count the electoral votes. If there's a tie, 269 to 269, or if for whatever reason, nobody gets a majority in, you know, if somebody gets 269, someone gets less than that, someone else gets less than that, um, you, you need a full majority of electoral votes. You need 270. If no one gets that, then it triggers a process of picking a president in the House and a process of picking the vice president in the Senate. And what it says, and this is in the Constitution, this isn't federal law. Um, what it says is that the House will pick the president, they will choose from the top three vote getters, and every state will get one vote. So Tennessee gets one vote, California gets one vote, Wyoming gets one vote. It's not each representative, it's each delegation voting on behalf of the state. And you need a full majority to win, so 26. So that's what would happen if you know, there was no, if no, if there was a tie or no one got a majority and for the vice president it would be in the Senate, you would need uh, a majority of senators of the full number. So you need at least 51 uh, to pick the vice president. And we've only seen this happen twice in American history. It was 1800 and 1824, but a lot of things are happening in 2020 and, and leading into 2021. So who knows, it could be the third time that the house is picking the president uh, in American history. The thing that is most interesting to me is whether or not DC will be counted in that vote. So we could have, you know, right now the state delegations are broken down. So it's 26 uh, uh, Republican House delegations. Uh, it's 23 Democratic House delegations and one and Pennsylvania split. Uh, but According to the 12th Amendment, DC is allowed to participate in, uh, uh, or sorry, I'm sorry, in the 23rd Amendment, DC will participate in the selection of the president per the 12th Amendment. And the process I just described is in the 12th Amendment. So a cursory reading of the Constitution says that DC also gets a vote. So as a 51st vote, it could potentially swing it. So my craziest election scenario, and I tweeted this a few, a few weeks ago, and uh, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, the uh, non-voting uh, delegate from DC in the House, uh, uh, liked this and retweeted it, but my craziest scenario is that there's a deadlock in the House and DC is the tie-breaking vote sometime between January 6th and January 20th to choose the President of the United States. I personally don't think it'll get to this point, but that is actually what could happen between if there is a, if there's not a majority of um, electoral votes for one person. Well, we may be in for a wild ride. We um, definitely somebody, <laughs> somebody asked, is there any prohibition um, to allocate electoral college um, by popular vote versus winner take all? So I'm assuming, Rick, what you mean is like a proportion. So if in one state, 
one person wins 60% and the other wins 40, could you split the electors that way so that it more perfectly reflects the actual popular vote rather than the person who wins gets all the delegates? So I'm not aware of a movement within the state that would, that would depend on the state. So each state would have its own process for doing that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's winner take all in 48 states. Two states, Nebraska and Maine, have something called the district method, which is their, whoever wins the popular vote in the entire state gets two electoral votes representing the two senators. And then the winner of each congressional district popular vote gets one electoral vote for that representative. So you can split the votes in Nebraska and Maine. And we've, we've seen this happen. A few candidates in, in, in recent elections have, have split the votes. So those are the only two scenarios right now where a state doesn't automatically give all its electors to the winner of the statewide popular vote. There is something that is, that is geared toward reforming the electoral college, which could only be reformed really in two ways. One of them is a constitutional amendment. The other is something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And this is an agreement that, is, that, is, that exists currently um, among states. And the idea is that a state will give its electoral votes, not to the winner of the popular vote in its, own, in its, the own, in its state, but the winner of the national popular vote. And so far, I believe 15 states have signed on to this. And the total electoral votes between those states I believe is 196. However, you need a total number of states where the electoral votes get to 270 in order for the compact to take effect. So if you can get other states to sign on between now and you know, the electoral vote, I guess, on the, on the 14th of December, then it, it would be states pledging their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote. Um, but right now it's been mostly Democratic led states that have signed on to, to this compact. Um, I don't foresee other states signing on to them, certainly not enough between now and, and the presidential election. So it's unlikely that this will happen during this election. It's possible it could happen in other elections, but in order to really reform the electoral college, it's gonna have to take a constitutional amendment. Yeah. One last election question is, because you hear people speculating about this, what are the specific circumstances under which the Speaker of the House becomes the president? So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Congress can decide the, um, uh, the line of succession to the presidency. And they have. They've passed a federal law that, lines, that outlines the line of succession to the presidency. And it's first the vice president, and that's in the Constitution. Um, after that, it is the Speaker of the House, followed by the Senate president pro tempore, and all the cabinet positions in order of their creation, starting with Secretary of State, which was the first, and ending with Homeland Security, which is the most recent. So if the uh, Speaker of the House were to become president, the way that would happen is if the, a president, nor, neither a president nor a vice president had been selected by January 20th uh, at 12 p.m. Or, I mean, the, the president and vice president could suddenly quit, and that could make the Speaker of the House president. Uh, they could both get impeached and removed. That could make the, uh, the Speaker of the House president. Or if no one is chosen, because the terms for president and vice president end at 12 p.m. Eastern time on January 20th, like, that, like flat out. So if no one is selected as president or vice president on, at that time on that date, then the line of succession would, would take over and it would be uh, the Speaker of the House. All right. Um, we had a, another question about kind of thinking back about the founders. So do you feel like they missed anything? So are there gaps in the Constitution, things you feel like they should have addressed and didn't? Uh, many. Uh, where, where to start? Um, I'd say one that keeps coming up uh, and, I, and I think about all the time is, is, is voting. I think by making it a state issue, uh, we've allowed for hundreds of years of voter disenfranchisement, voter suppression. Um, I know that it was done to get states to agree to the Constitution, but it feels like, even though Congress can override it, it feels like a fundamental flaw in the system. And you know, in the last seven years, we've seen so much voter disenfranchisement because part of the congressional law, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, was struck down. And so a lot of states that used to have to get permission from the federal government to change their voting laws so that they didn't make racist voting laws like they'd been doing for a long time, they no longer have to get permission. 
So they can do whatever they want and change laws, whatever they want. And, and we're seeing this happen. People, uh, you know, having to um, fill out a postcard and return it in a certain amount of time in order if they want to keep their right to vote. People being removed from voting rolls without knowing it. Uh, exact match of, of your name on your registration versus uh, your, um, uh, your, your driver's license. Your signature matching your driver's license or social security card, you know, and this is like, poll workers are not forensics experts. They're not, you know, they're not trained in this. So the fact that, you know, in 2018, in Florida, there were people looking at absentee ballots and looking at like people's driver's license and comparing the signatures and throwing out the ballot if it didn't look similar. I just signed, you know, a bunch of books. My signature doesn't look the same from one book to another. It's terrifying. So by creating this decentralized system of allowing who can and can't vote, I think it's, it, it is a massive fundamental flaw. And you can see this by looking at the amount of amendments that have to deal with voting rights. We have 27 constitutional amendments. About uh, almost a third of, of, a third of the ones that aren't part of the Bill of Rights. So take away the Bill of Rights, which all happened at once, right? That leaves 17. About a third of those have to deal with voting and voting rights. So clearly this is something that has been needed to be amended more often and more frequently than anything else in the constitution. So the, the fact that we don't have, you know, this constitutional right to vote, the fact that it left it up to the states um, is in my opinion, the biggest uh, fundamental flaw. And, and, I, and I also believe the electoral college is a huge, is a huge flaw. You know, it gave slaveholding states a way to have power in choosing the president without letting the vast majority of people in their state vote and not letting any slaves vote. So, the Electoral College voting, issues around voting, I think, are the biggest uh, uh, flaw in the Constitution that we're still seeing, you know, like flashing and blinking red today. Um, we're at time, so I want to make sure that we have um, people can ask final questions if they want to. So I'm going to ask you if you're still on the call um, and have any final questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask them directly. That'll probably be a little faster, but before we do that, I um, want to just pause briefly. Today is September 11th, so I want us to just take a quick moment of silence um, in memory of the people who um, died in the terrorist attacks in 2001. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody have final questions for Ben? I'm gonna put your book uh, back up while we wait. Thank you. <laughs> a, a, a quick one for Ben. Ben, um, these guys were locked in a room and they're writing away and they're, they're getting their work done. How did they communicate back in with the people in the streets in their home states? How did they communicate back and forth to make sure that they were representing the voices back home. Are you talking about the people at the Constitutional Convention? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how, how you know, in today's day of computers, we could have gone back and forth and they could poll people and they, we have newspapers that got out. How did they communicate such that they knew that they were representing the majority? Well, the truth is, well, the mode of communication was by, by letter, you know, delivered by, by horseback, no cell phones, no, right. uh, uh, no Skype, but um, it was, you know, I don't, and they were representing really more the state governments than the people. It was, it was the people's revolt, one of the reasons, but largely the people's revolt that happened in Massachusetts that concerned this elite group of people. So, I think they were concerned about representing the, the will of the, the leaders in their state more than they were the, the people in their state because they gave the people only, you know, one half of one branch of government to vote for. And it was only if their state gave them the permission to vote for that. So, you know, people didn't, weren't given the right to vote for senators. We still don't have the right to vote for a uh, president. We've never had the right to vote for justices. So, it really was less about making sure the residents of a state were represented at the convention, but the, the leaders of the state uh, were, were represented and, and they corresponded through, uh, through letter back and forth. But it was really a lot of, uh, you know, 
these representatives just hashing it out and people came and went, you know, it wasn't, again, it was 55 total, but people came and went. Some people didn't make it to the end. Some people came at the end. Um, 39 ended up signing it. Three didn't. Um, but it happened in such a short amount of time that there wasn't, you know, room for a lot of correspondence. If you're yeah. from a state that was really far away, you know, you're not having too many opportunities to go back and forth by letter because we're talking about a period of less than four months. Mm. All right. Any other final questions for Ben? Not. Thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to really say really quickly that um, yeah. if anyone has a question for me, I'm happy they can email me. Uh, my email is ben at omgwtf dot <laughs> um, I'm happy to chat it as well. But if you have a question and, and want me to answer it, I'm happy to uh, happy to do that. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, and just as a reminder to everyone, this is our final Lunch and Learn um, for this uh, Hebrew year. Um, we're taking a break for High Holy Days and we will be back on October 16th. Deborah. Yes, actually, yes. <laughs> first, first, again, just thank you so much to, to Ben. You weren't able to, some of, the, some of the messages came to me privately, but you got rave reviews throughout this whole call. So thank you so much for being here. It was very valuable, very meaningful. Um, all very important lessons and you really have brought it down in a very manageable way and we appreciate it. I did put my email also in the chat if anyone what, would like to uh, work through me to get a copy of your book. I'm happy to help with that also. Um, we will re we are taking a break over the Jewish holidays. We resume uh, with this format mm -hmm. on October the 16th and our guest on the 16th will be Mr. Clifton Harris who is the director of the um, Urban League of Nashville. And so we'll continue some of the racial conversations that we've engaged in. Also, just a shout out, we will also have a feel good music event during Sukkot on October 8th. People will be getting more info on that, but uh, we will do a bit of a break for an upbeat musical event and then come back to the issues at hand on October 16th. Hey, thank you Deborah again, everyone. And Deborah and Leslie, thank you for organizing these calls this these oh. past weeks. They've been wonderful. Thank Second you. that emotion. Shabbat <laughs> <laughs> shalom. Shabbat shalom and shana tova, everyone. Thank, thank you, you again so for much. joining and us. Thank and you again. This and was thank great. you again. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Shana tova. Shana tova. Thank you.